Hi, I'm Tim and welcome to Malvern Uniting. Uh, today is our final in our series on lament and hope and I hope it's a real blessing to you. Kids Church on Zoom today. The older kids will be doing a Lego challenge and we will be talking about the healing miracles that Jesus did. Uh, for the younger children, we'll share the story of Samuel and Eli and the way that Samuel heard the voice of God. And how do we hear God today? I think it's going to be a great morning and I hope the children really enjoy it. Good morning, everybody. Would you please join me in prayer? Our gracious, loving and priceless Heavenly Father, it is our privilege and joy to take time out this morning to honour you and give thanks for your uplifting and unmistakable presence in our lives. Approximately 3,050 years ago, Solomon was commissioned to build the temple in Jerusalem as a permanent home for the covenant box, as a sign of God's desire to live among his people, to lead them, to care for them, and to guide them in the paths of righteousness. At that time, Solomon's father, David, is thought to have written Psalm 95, which includes these two verses. Come, let us bow down and worship him. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. 
He is our God. We are the people he cares for, the flock for which he provides. Lord God, you've always loved and honoured those who have sought you and put you first in their lives. And through the birth, death and resurrection of Jesus, you have opened the way for us to have a personal relationship with you an abundant life in Christ and an unshakable hope for the future. You are an awesome God and it is sometimes difficult for us to understand how we, with our shortcomings, continue to be forgiven and loved by you. We take a private moment now, Lord, to say thank you. In our greatly troubled world, turned upside down as it is by the coronavirus, with fear and turmoil occupying hearts worldwide, and the fragile certainties on which so many have built their lives being called into question, We've come to a point where it is timely and necessary for mankind to seriously take stock of our priorities. It is so evident that worldwide people have been prepared to surrender their wills and freedoms to frontline politicians and health authorities and workers. Here in Australia, We've been so wonderfully served by these totally committed and selfless people and we take a moment now to thank you for them and to pray for them. Lord, it is interesting to see how willingly, with few exceptions, people have been prepared to set aside selfishness and to think of the safety and well-being of others. And there is a palpable feeling that the world is a better place because of it. Glaring selfishness is roundly condemned. And this more caring attitude to others is absolutely consistent with the teaching of Jesus to care for our neighbours. It is in this context that Malvern Church is seeking to exercise its ministry. How blessed we are with our new leadership team and we thank you, Lord, for each one of them. Help us to become excited about joining with them in creating an authentic community in which people, young and old, feel compelled through sound teaching and example to turn to Jesus and become new creations in Christ. We can only dare to imagine the blessings that God has in store for us. The gospel singer George Beverly Shea in the beautiful hymn, How Great Thou Art, between verses 1 and 2, inserted the spoken words. We can only see a little of the ocean as we stand on the rocky shore, but out there, beyond the eye's horizon, there's more. We can only see a little of God's loving, a few rich treasures from his mighty store, but out there, Beyond the eye's horizon, there's more. There's more. Dear Lord, help us to lift our eyes. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hi, I'm Erin, reading the Bible reading this morning from the beautiful Belair National Park. And I have Henry with me to keep me company. The reading this morning comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 to 7. 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this and I will be his God and he will be my son. To read a novel is to engage in a certain rhythm and dynamic. For me anyway, this actually begins in the bookstore. Uh, I don't quite judge a book by its cover, but I do buy its first page. Um, and if it grabs you, you've got to buy it. If it doesn't, I generally buy it anyway. And, um, you know, you get home and you, you read a bit and um, find out what's going on. But eventually the book grabs you. The current of the book takes you on its journey and time sort of changes a little bit and you get lost in it. And now there might be some good patches and bad patches and if I'm halfway through and nothing's happening I'm pretty impatient I have to say but if it's going really well it's a delight and you're thinking or at least I am how can I get back to that it's like this thing that's waiting there at the end of the day or at some stage where I get to go and be back in that world again but if it's going really well then the ending becomes incredibly crucial because you're looking as the pages are getting thinner and thinner and you're feeling the story and wondering, is this going to resolve in a satisfying way? Some novels end badly. They, they just peter out or you get bored or it's all too quick. Um, others actually are a bit too neat, particularly if the story's had a real sense of ambiguity and um, a lot of interesting things going on, all being wrapped up a bit too tight can feel a bit artificial. Um, in the 90s, there was a whole series of um, some postmodern kind of novels which would just stop halfway through the um, plot, the narrative, in midstream, and you'd be left feeling like, hang on, I want one more chapter or so to be able to resolve it more satisfyingly. And every now and then you have a novel that's just perfect. I remember years ago reading um, an Ian McEwan novel on Chesil Beach, and it felt like the last few pages were the last few stanzas of a poem. It just flowed like it was easing, like a wave on the beach. And you got, as I turned the last page, reading it, thinking how perfect and exhilarating, even as I'm lost in what's happening. And right to the last line, it was perfect. Those books are rare, but boy, are they satisfying. But I've noticed it's interesting that um, they're also the ones I tend to go back and reread again. There's something about knowing how well it ends and satisfies that makes the savouring of the story worthwhile doing again. I know a lot of novels are not designed that way. Detective novels and the mystery to know the ending is actually to ruin it. But Going back and savouring an adventure when the ending is satisfying can be a very rich experience. My kids do this with the Harry Potter books. They don't just, didn't just read the first one, they read all of them and then they read them all again and then again and again. And they just love being in the satisfying world and it comes together in a way that feels, for them, complete and proper. In this series, we've been talking about lament and hope. We've been talking about the fact that Christianity has a very realistic, full-fronted, open-faced appreciation and engagement with the reality of life, including suffering. 
It doesn't shy away from that and gives us the uh, power of lament in the midst of it. But that power at least partly comes from the fact that we have hope. The lament is not overwhelming because of the hope that is there and the hope that's offered to us. We live in a society that to some degree has a crisis of hope. A modern Western world often despairs and is lost or tries to live in the immediate and the now and cultivate hope in little things, often tries to buy it. People too, we can have individual crises of hope, wondering uh, what's going to happen and despairing about the dystopian way it feels like all things are heading. It can be because in the West our understanding, our definition of hope is much more like a thermometer, the way things are going, heading, feeling right now. We think about it in terms of recent history. Things are looking hopeful. Things are not feeling hopeful. We wonder about it because of very recent history. It's a bit like watching a football match and you're a few goals down. Things are not looking hopeful and we don't feel a lot of hope. Then we get a goal. Hey, suddenly I'm feeling more hopeful, but then the other team gets another goal and suddenly that hope disappears. It goes up and down like a thermometer, just taking a temperature of the way things are. That's a very thin understanding of hope. It's basically a description of the flow and ebb of the soundtrack of the way things are. But when we come to the biblical account of lament and of hope, the Christian hope isn't presented as, to us as being something that we can grasp at or wonder about or just measure the way things are. It's presented less like a thermometer and, and more like a thermostat. That is, it's presented to us as a promise, as a surety. It's grounded in events, not just wonderings. In fact, if you think about true hope, a lot of the way we live our life with hope is based around not just what's happening now, but concrete and sure hope is based around the way things are going to be. That is, if something has happened in the future or we know is happening in the future, it makes the present far more livable. We can get through today if we know that that is just up ahead. Now that's a thin hope if it's based in thin air, particularly because it's about the future. And here's the key. Christianity offers a hope about the future based on events that have already happened in the past. Because of what's happened in the past, the future is secure, which means I can live in the present. I can live with peace. So what are these events? To what am I referring? Well, of course, the past events for us are, in Christian terms, what God has done in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the climax of which, the very core of which, is the death and resurrection. Now, why do I turn to death as a subject? Really because an enormous amount of the lack of hope, the despair, the crisis of hope we feel is connected to our ultimate fear of death. In fact, this is why so often suffering is an unwelcome and an overwhelming disruption in our life because it reminds us of the fragility of life. Attending someone else's funeral is like smelling salts. It's, it shocks us. To experience it in our life is to remind us that we are not invincible, whether it's an illness or some other level of suffering. We suddenly realise there is, there is an end, that death is there. Woody Allen is a character who over the years has taken this despair in the face of uh, death uh, as a great theme. And he says, 
in his uh, films. And he says um, at one point, when it comes to death, uh, I'm strictly against it. Uh, I really don't want to be there when it happens. But then he says more seriously, all men fear death. It's a natural fear that consumes us all. We fear death because we feel that we haven't loved well enough or haven't loved at all, which ultimately are one and the same thing. It's funny that he connects it to love and whether we've loved well enough, whether we've done enough. It's almost like he says that in death there is a reckoning, a final judgment of the way we've lived and the kind of person we are, but particularly the way in which we've loved. Have we loved sufficiently with enough integrity in an all-consuming, in an unconditional way? Have we lived and loved in the way that he seems to imply we deep down know that we ought to have or that we should? So there's a sense by which in death there is a full stop but also a judgment. We fear it because it brings to an end the opportunity we have to live a certain way. T.S. Eliot goes further and says that actually people fear not death because there's nothing after, but death because there may be. And a lot of other writers start talking and, and pointing into that direction as well. What is it that's so existentially confronting about death? It's terrifying. It's an intrusion. It seems in many ways so unnatural. And so how do you deal with it? Well, this is why I return to the theme of Jesus. Because Christianity says to us that actually a God who has created the world providentially has entered into it and died. A God who has chosen to face death full on. The writer in Hebrews puts it like this. In bringing many sons and daughters in glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make a pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. What he's saying, God who through all things happen has made a pioneer of salvation through suffering. That word pioneer is, is a strange one. It's in the Greek, the word archagos, which means pioneer or founder or leader. It really refers to someone who's going to do something for the first time, making a way for others. Another word that's often translated is author. The author of our salvation. He says, basically, God is saving the world through Jesus Christ. He's making a way of salvation for us through Jesus, by Jesus being the author of a new way to life. He says and goes on, He too shared in our humanity so that by his death he might break the power of death by whom who holds the power of death, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The Bible's realistic about the fact that we live with a fear of death, and that inside of that is that reckoning, that judgment, that finality of what have I done and have I done enough? Many people at that moment before death, looking at it, staring at its inevitability, face that question, what have I done and have I done enough and how can I make amends for what I might have done? The writer, of course, goes for, further and says, actually, ultimately, you can't. You can't defeat death yourself. You can't get out of life alive. But also, you can't face whatever judgment, whatever reckoning there is, simply through the record of your own life. 
Paul in 1 Corinthians says, Christ indeed has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, Adam, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For in Adam all die, and so in Christ all will be made alive. He's pointing out the Christian understanding that in death, Jesus has gone into death on our behalf and made a way for us to go into death and has risen again to life and made a way for us in Christ to come into life. Essentially, what we see in the life of Jesus is God entering into the fullness of death for us and rising again, unpacking, disempowering, dismantling the power of death and certainly the fear of death. The Christian understanding is that actually God is doing to the whole world, to all creation, what he did to Jesus on Easter Sunday, raising back to life a new humanity and a new creation. And that opportunity then exists for the Christian to say, you know what, because God has gone into death on my behalf, I can go into death knowing that it is really a pathway to life. You actually recognise, as the writer goes on, that death has been swallowed up in victory. And the question is then asked rhetorically, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? There is a sting in death. There is a sadness. There is a grief. There is a lament as we face it ourselves, and as others go into that place, Paul encourages us in the writings to weep with those who weep. But the sting is removed. The grief and the lament is there, but the hope removes the sting. The hope that this is not final that God has actually entered into death ahead of us, for us, indeed for us individually and personally, but also for all of creation. And so, as Tim Keller puts it, we actually have the opportunity to face suffering and even to face death with grief, but not overwhelming grief, also with hope. He says, we neither have a stifling grief that gives way to despair or repressed anger or unchecked rage, but hope in our grief makes actually us wise, compassionate, humble and tender-hearted. We're actually able to grieve fully and yet with profound hope. As the writer of Hebrews says, let us hold unswervingly to this hope we profess because he who promised is faithful. This is the great gift about the Christian message. Because of what Jesus has done, that Jesus has entered into this world and entered into death on our behalf and for us. We know that he is faithful because he has already acted. And so how we've lived, our record, whether we've been faithful, our faithlessness on occasion, is not the ultimate concern. It is God who has been the faithful one. We have a hope because Christ was faithful. And it's just so magnificent. Because if Jesus died so you don't have to pay for anything in your past, and he has risen to be your living saviour, then ultimately, what can death do to you? You can face it with that strange mix of courage, but then also compassion. It's a marvellous thing that actually what Christ has achieved in the past opens up for us a new future. And the scripture that we heard today from Revelation 21 paints a picture of what that ultimately looks like. That end, 
that we can save a life because of the way it ends. And it ends not even just perfectly as an ending, a promise, but as a reconciliation and a renewal of all things. That ultimately the end of this story is not even just the perfect ending to a novel, but because Christ is the author, it is the opening of a whole new epic world, a new creation, when heaven and earth have actually come together and the kingdom of God is full and complete. It's a bit like finishing The Hobbit and going, what a marvellous and perfect ending, only to realise that the three epic, massive Lord of the Rings novels pivot off into a whole new adventure, more glorious and more beautiful than ever. And so this is the call upon us as Christians, actually, to know lament and to know hope, to have courage because we know the hope and to have compassion because we have the capacity to lament, to live a life implementing that victory of God in the world around about us, to participate in that new creation. Because there is a sure hope that God will wipe away the tear of every eye, we can be about going out of our comfort zone with courage and compassion into dangerous places, into complex situations, with love beyond boundaries to those, even even our enemies, and speak to them with courage and compassion of what Christ has done for us. The gospel is the marvellous good news that God has come in Jesus Christ into our world. And that means everything has changed the past, the future, and therefore our present. The power of God's kingdom has entered history to renew the whole world. And therefore we have a sure hope. There is a resurrection. There is a reconciliation and a renewal of all things. And our world needs people with that courage and compassion, with that conviction who can live a life towards those who are hurting, to those who are lost, to those who fear. It's a marvellous and freeing thing to live a life of freedom because you're not scared of death. Not because you're death-defying, but because you have hope. Because you can rest in the record of what Jesus has done. Ultimately, This is the life we're called to live as Christians, where we weep with those who weep, but not without hope.
marvellous that here in Adelaide some of the restrictions are lifting and we're able to have groups of up to 10 now on the church building and doing different things here. It really is marvellous for the whole community the way we're able to move past this even as we continue in prayer for other parts of the world. It will be a still a little while until we're able to come together and gather as church but I pray that this continues to be a blessing in this format. Next week we move into a series on encounters with Jesus but until then I pray may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And you're going out and in your coming in. And you're lying down and in your rising up, in your labour, in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears until we all come to stand before Jesus on that day where there is no sunset and no morning. Amen.